one. And I want you all to prepare to move through this chapter or this book with me, excuse me. We're going to try to focus on this book for a little while and get some stuff out of it. I don't know why it looks so dark. Oh, that light is out. That's what it is. That, that's always out. Okay, this is what we could do. Who was upstairs? No one. Can you turn these lights off and on one more time? And see if that would get that one to come on. It looked like it want to come on, but it don't. It's been here, what, three years, four years? Yeah. Almost time for them to blow anyway. No, the sanctuary lights. It's going to say sanctuary or wall sconce. The sconce in the sanctuary ought to be, there you go. All right. Come on, baby, in Jesus' name. Uh, Let's just let it stay. It looked like it wanted to come on. All right, we're going to go ahead and look at Deuteronomy chapter 1. We're not going to spend our night gazing into the sky. <laughs> Even though that's a beautiful thing to do, we're not going to spend our night gazing there. All right, here's the thing that I want us to, to know or to kind of be uh, conscious of when we start talking about the book of Deuteronomy. I think uh, Dennis introduced it as uh, the last book of Moses, the first five books uh, in the New Te Old Testament, excuse me, are accredited to the writing of Moses. We're here at the last book of Moses, and y'all got to look like y'all interested, even if you're not, because I can see your faces. Okay? <laughs> so, so, so here is the thing that I want us to be very conscious of, because my question to the, to the particular writing is why is it that God gives us this book through Moses? And really, <clears throat> what is this book all about? Now, I want you to understand a couple of things um, as an introduction to this book is that I ask, as I've been reading through it, I've been asking the question, what is the main thing that is holding the thread throughout? What I found at least in my uh, little mind, is that God is really trying to get the nation of Israel or the Israelites to understand who he is in hope that they will fall in love with him. Now, can I ask you a question and answer it at the same time? What really is the major issue with the church of today? It's not that God is not blessing us. That's not our issue. It's not that God is not showing up for us. It's not that God is not answering prayers. It's not that God is not delivering. It's not that God is not making ways. It's not that God is not showing his hand. The problem with church today is our response to what we're getting from God. Think about it. If God doesn't waver and God is always found faithful, then is there an issue with God? It's not. The issue becomes uh, more to light that is with the followers of God than it is with the leading of God. Stay with me, yes. Is it that we don't know what the response he wants from us? I think the answer to that question is no. We know the response that he wants from us. I think the thing is that we're not releasing ourselves in the way that God wants us to release. What is it that God wants from us? It's on my face, it's on my Instagram post. Can I read it to you? I read this from the messenger the other day and it rocked me because I was like, there it is. I've been trying to preach this for years. It says this from messenger, Ephesians 1, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. Watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Listen to what it says. Keep company with God and learn a life of love. 
Watch this. Observe how Christ loved us. I got into this discussion with a preacher today. The church want to love, but her way. But she doesn't want to love the way Christ loved. We'll talk about that in a second. Now watch this. Christ's love was not cautious, but it was extravagant. This is a sentence I like. He didn't love us in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. The last statement is love like this. Can I talk about it for a second? When we talk about loving like Christ, this is what Jesus says. By this, the world will know you are my disciple. So what the pastor said to me today is, the church doesn't want to be discipled. I say, yes, she does. They say, no, she doesn't. Watch, because discipleship means I follow Christ. Most of us want to follow what's in our head. And the opinion of others. And the advice that we get from other folk. Because here is what Christ says. Love those that hate you. When folk hate us, what's our response? I don't need them Negroes anyway. Or we say, I'm going to love them at a distance. Is God loving at distance? Or is God loving up close? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to forgive them, but I ain't going to forget it. And I tell you what, they won't catch me twice like this. Is God getting caught twice like that? Yes, he is. Because when we repent, we repent to escape the wrath with the intent of going back that we'll repent again. Then we'll go back to repent again. Then go back to repent again. Our repentance has nothing to do with correction. It's, a, it's to escape the wrath of God. I'm sorry, I kicked myself. Here is what it does. When we love like Christ, here is what we got to see. How many people did Christ act out with on the cross? None. How many people did he get out of character with on the cross? How many people did he profess hate for on the cross? Even when he was being killed by the religious sect, who did he call to the red carpet? His words were these. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Mother, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. I thirst. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. It's finished. I'm thirsty. Why hast thou forsaken me? Nothing was pointed to the people except a prayer of intercession. To love like Christ is to know. Listen to what I told the pastor. That it's going to be difficult, but it's possible. Christ loves us, not, at, not to get something from us, but that we would have everything of him. And out of that, with our eyes wide open, we would declare, no one loves us like Christ. And if no one loves us like Christ, I want to love him back. It's not to manipulate us. And it's, it's almost bad to say, but we preach a manipulative gospel. Yes. When praises go up, blessings come down. So what we're saying is the greater your praise, the greater your, your blessings. So we're encouraging folk to praise for blessings. Rather than praising because he's worth it. I praise you not to get anything out of you. I praise you because you are simply God. Jesus tells us very plainly. If you go after heaven in righteousness. Just because you're in pursuit of the kingdom. And because you are in pursuit of righteousness. 
everything else going to come to you. So our zeal or our aim as believers ought to be going after kingdom and going after righteousness and then watch God bless our lives. Because we're in pursuit of the kingdom and righteousness. Christ didn't love us to get anything out of us, but he loved us that we may have everything of him for ourselves. So how does all this tie in? Because when we start in Deuteronomy, here's where the story starts. God wants a people that will benefit from his love and that will respond to his love by saying, I recognize I've been called forward. I did this illustration Sunday with Dennis. I did it Sunday with Asia. I said, what does salvation looks like, look like? Does anybody in the church want to know what salvation looks like? What does it mean or what does it look like to be saved? She was the only somebody that said, well, yes, I do. You know what I told Asia? Come here. Asia came up here and stood with me. And I said to her, look at the rest of the church. What salvation looks like is that we've been called out of the world. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> we've been called out of the world. Salvation looks like you stand alone with God. Salvation looks like I've been set apart from them. I'm not better than them. I'm just better than what I used to be. Amen. See, it's not about them ever. It's about you being better. And this is what God is giving Moses this book for so that the Israelite will understand. Listen, you are to be called out from among nations and look like, I'm over in chapter 4, I'm sorry, but look like you belong to Jehovah. Can we jump into the text now? Chapter 1. Moses tells us there's a specific month a specific year in a specific day that God starts his dialogue. It's the 11th month. It's the first day of the month. I think I'm right. In the 40th year. You have been in the wilderness how long? 40 years. But in the 11th month of the 40th year, which is almost getting ready to be an end, and in the first day of that month, God tells me to talk to us. And what God calls us together to see, I'm now at verse number five, six. He tells them, turn, take your journey, go to the mountain of the Amorites, unto the places that are nigh there to the plains, the hills, the valleys, the south, by the seaside, by the land, to the land of Canaan, where God is saying to them, this is the way I want you to travel. I want you on 55 and not on State Street. I want you on 55 and not on Frontage Road. I want you on 55 and not back on Old Canton Road. All of it will lead you to Canton, but I want you on 55 getting there. In other words, God is a God of specific instructions. God is a God of order, and when you get instruction from God, there is no alternative. I hope y'all hear me. God is telling them how you're going to get to Canaan. How? Turn yourself and take your journey and get started towards Canaan. Are you with me? He says the reason I'm doing this is because I have made a covenant with your forefathers that you will go into the land of Canaan and you can possess it. I hope y'all don't miss the sermon Sunday about delivered but still damaged you can go into Canaan and not possess it how do I know because you were in the land with the millions but you were captives come on somebody you can be in a place and still not possess it so God tells them you are taking this journey to go into the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because I promised them they would have it. 
I asked the question this morning, how was Abram declared righteous? Why did God call him righteous? Because he obeyed God. God told Abram, get your belonging, leave the land of the Chaldeans, and go to the land that I'm going to show you. I asked this question the other day of somebody. Can you find it in the Bible where Abraham went back to a family reunion, to a funeral, to a wedding, to check up on the sick and the shut-in of his family? When Abram left the land of the Chaldeans, he never returned because God's instruction was, get from among your folk and go. Sometimes our deliverance is delayed and our damage prolongs itself because we want to visit old spots and old friends and old landmarks and old situations. We want to go see dead folk and we want to go to hang around family members that are dead to us because they're doing the same old repetitive curse. <laughs> is this thing on? You go to a family reunion to end up mad with the same mess that you went to the last family reunion and left mad about. Because family ain't interested in recovery. They're interested in recalling. Well, she, her mama wrong, my mama. We don't fool with them, child. Come on, let's talk about family reunion. We got some dysfunctional families. And we go to family reunion with all the same t-shirts, with the same location, with one group under that tree, another group under that tree, and another group over there in the events, and our children playing together until we pull them apart and say, you ain't supposed to play with them. Why? And God knows, don't let one of them start crying because mama's child did something to them. We get ready to tear this family reunion up. God told Moses, go. I'm taking you to a new land. And I want you to go with me. I want you to hear what I'm saying in verse number eight. The promise that I'm making is not just to the forefathers, but it's to your seed. The reason why we need to obey God, y'all, is because our obedience in the blessings thereof is tied to Alicia, Denitria, Gary, Madison, Kennedy, Xander, and the children unborn. How do I know this? Because the children that left Egypt don't go to Canaan, but their children does. So even though y'all gonna miss out, I made a promise to you, Abram, your children, your seeds will go. He goes on and talk about, you all are too many people for me to have on my shoulder. But guess what the epiphany of this is? God promised Abram that his seed would be more than the sand. So Moses acknowledges here in verse number 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, that he acknowledges that God kept his promise by multiplying you all. Then Moses sets up a class leader system. He sets up a cell group system. He said, for those of you that could judge a thousand, do it. Those of you who could judge a hundred, do it. Those that could do fifty, do it. What I'm going to do is divide the problems up among you. But that which you can't handle, you bring it to me. The admonishment here is that don't you be selfish in your judgment, but judge righteously. I mean, verse number 16. I don't care what they mama did to you. When judgment comes to your court, set your personal issues aside and judge righteously. We cannot be a progressive church holding on to things and taking things personal. I don't even want to get into forgiveness no more because I talked about that enough today with a preacher. Because we got to move from this template of I forgave it, but I ain't going to forget it. Is that how God forgives? The psalm tells us that he separated our sins, our fault, our offense as far as the east is from the west. Y'all know they don't ever come together again. You're saying that's hard. It is, but that's your charge.
But I feed them with a long handled spoon. Well, guess what? Your spoon is longer than you think. Because guess what Jesus says in his prayer? As I forgive my offenders, God, you forgive me the same way. And I want you to know God is watching your actions. You can play with this if you want to and come in here and shout and roll on the floor, foam at the mouth, speak in tongues, break up things if you want to, get your belly all swove and spit all kind of stuff on this floor. But if you ain't forgiving folk the way you want to be forgiven, your stuff is still in the balance. All you done is a spiritual exercise. That's all you've done. Ask yourself this question. I'm telling you, I am learning to forgive the offender while I'm going through it. There are people that are not going to ever come back and say, I'm sorry, but you got to let it go because it's good for your health. You got to stop thinking about, oh, these Negroes ain't going to get over on me. You better think about it. You won't get over the bridge into the gate. There's swings from the north, south, east, and west. I heard somebody say 12 gates to the city. If you're going to get over yonder, you better let this go. It's not about them getting over on you. It's about you getting over the hurdle that will cause stagnation in your life. What I don't want us to do I wrote this up here because I don't like writing. God did not intend it for them to stay where they were. Where you are today spiritually, God does not intend for you to stay where you are. I've done all this talking. I don't know how much time I got left. I got to get out of chapter one. Here is what I need you to know. All of what I'm talking about is imagery. Because God created us in chapter one, chapter two of Genesis, chapter 126. God says, let us create him in our image and after our likeness. God intended for Israelites to look like God. Somewhere between chapter 3 and chapter 4, Moses gives a revelation. Why God gives them the Ten Commandments. Moses gives a revelation. Why do you give us these instructions? I'm going to ask you all this question. Why is it that God gives them the Ten Commandments? Because those are a set of rules that help us as painters paint the picture of God. Okay. Church, the paintbrush is in your hand. Okay. What picture do you want them to see of God? And the only way you can strike your brush to the canvas is do your living. The only way your brush strikes the canvas is do your living. Let me tell you something. You can't cuss folk out and expect that to be holy. You can't backbite, lie, be jealous, and envy and expect that paintbrush to look like God. I'm sorry. It's tough. But God said you can handle that. You can handle it. He doesn't intend for you to be where you are. Where you are right now and, and, and I don't know if this has been posted on Instagram yet, but complacency is a threat to progress. Complacency is a threat to progress. If you satisfied with your religion you got now, and you don't want no more growth, you're not going to progress in the fall. I want you to know that there is an ascension. There's a glory of us that's revealed even after we're dead. There's a glory of us that's revealed when we get to heaven. We don't stop growing. Even in heaven, God reveals more of him for us to see. Y'all ain't got to agree with me. But I already asked the text the question. Why is Paul talking about a third and a fourteenth heaven? Because God knows on level one you're going to get bored. So he takes you to level two. 
then you're going to get bored, you're going to go to level three. I don't care where you are doing the same thing every day, you're going to get tired of it. I don't care if you go to Disney, keep getting on the same rides every day. And it can be a different ride. You getting in Disney every day, getting up going, you're going to get tired of it. You're going to ask your children, your children going to ask you, can we go somewhere else? So apply that to your life. Can we move? He goes on, he talks to them. Abraham is what I talked about. He took the chief priest and he divided them up into cell groups. He put captains according to their ability. He says in 16, I charge your judges at that time to hear the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that was with him. He says this, 17, you are not to have a respected person. Just because you like them better than you like me, don't you let that come up in your judgment. We got to learn how to tell the truth because truth don't care what your address is. Truth don't care how much your money. Truth don't care about your gender. It doesn't care about your race or nationality. Truth is truth. Y'all hear what we're saying? In church, we got to be careful how we jump up and let some folks sit and we make other folks stand. We have to be careful who we're going to speak to and who we're not. Let me tell you the danger of that. The folk you're speaking to are really people that value you to an extent. The people that you're probably overlooking are the ones that are really crying out to God for mercy. They're asking God, God, if you're real, show me your heart. And when we walk by folk and we don't even know their condition or their predicament, we just walk by because, oh, I don't know them. That's the reason why you speak. We did something this evening. And we met some folk and learned some stuff about some folk. It was one guy first time ever working with us. But did he not feel welcome? Had a blast. And learned something about all of us today. And all we did was move tables in chairs you don't know how you touch people just by reaching out to them and you never know what doors God opens just by coming together you don't know and just because I look like I'm somebody that you can get some from it don't mean I'm your right connection I'm going to just be honest with y'all. I used to be horrible about praying for folk. Reverend, pray for me. Okay. Man, I'm trying to get general claim. I'm trying to remember to mail that check. I'm trying to remember to get my head count so I can send it in. I'm trying to get a form filled out. You done said pray, I forgot. That's why now when people say pray for me, I'll say amen. Which means that whatever you're asking me to pray for, I touch and agree with it right now. I'm not putting it off till tomorrow. If you tell me to pray, why are you asking me to pray? I'm like, Lord, hear and honor that prayer. So when we're done with the conversation, I've already prayed. But not everybody is intentional like that. The only reason I grew to that place was because I was guilty of forgetting. And I recognized that that was one of my weaknesses. So he says, don't you have respect the person, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. You should not be afraid of the face of man, nor the judgment, for the judgment is God's. And for that cause, is it too hard for you? Bring it to me. And I hear, if you're scared they ain't going to like you, bring it to me. you scared they're going to fall out with you, bring it to me. you scared they ain't going to gonna take you off their friend list on Facebook, bring it to me. But the admonishment is, don't be afraid of their faces. I'm going to tell y'all what we're lost at. Pride. We're too concerned about how we're going to look if that happens. I'm telling you, as God would take, <laughs> as God would divest or disrobe or take off, I'm telling you one thing God wants to take off of us is pride. And I'm going to tell you, God will deal with your pride. 
he'll deal with it. I can tell you what happened to me. 24, 23 years ago, I was in my living room. Two guys came to pray for me. I was pastoring a church. At this particular time in ministry, I had been in ministry five, two and a half, one, so roughly three, three and a half years in ministry. I felt that the system was built on who you know. I was riding, hanging with the top dogs. I had access to elders and if I wanted to, exposure to bishops. I'm just riding and chilling. One day in my living room, these guys came to pray for me. God gave me instructions that night. You are no longer to be a part. What I'm going to do with your life, nobody will ever be able to take credit for it. Because I'll be doing it. My life was as dark as the face of this phone. I went into a place that was black, dark except for the light of a needle of a pen. And all I can remember praying was, God, don't let me die. Don't let me die. Don't let me die. Don't let me die. After a while, the light got brighter. And God says to me, what I'm doing with you, nobody can take credit for it. At the end of that, I ended my pastorate charge and started Victory Church. I requested to come out of rotation. I said to the bishop, I don't want any church that's on the books. And that's all I said. We started Bible class in the living room. And that Bible class grew to the church called Victory. I used to get upset. Not one presiding elder came to visit us. And only one presiding elder checked on us. And when I complained to God about it, God told me, didn't I tell you? Nobody would take credit for what I'm doing with you. I can tell you this. It's been lonely. But it's been worth it. It's been hard, but it's been worth it. When you can wake up and somebody can't say to you, nobody can say to you, look at what I've done for you. That's a good feeling. Are you with me? God says, if it's too hard, bring it to me. I told some people in Florida last week, I think I need to be admitted to a mental institution. I did. I told, to some, I told some people in, in Orlando, I said, I need to be admitted to a mental institution. Because what I'm looking at, you and I talked about this, Dennis, what I'm looking at is foolery and mockery to me. And it only makes sense to me. And it was bothering me. So I said, I, I, I need to go, I need to go to a million, I need to be on somebody's couch, talking, because something is wrong with me. So God says to them, watch this. Verse number 21. Behold, the Lord has said, I set this land before you. Go up, possess the land as God of thy fathers has said unto thee, fear not, neither be discouraged. I like the way that Moses keep writing this about not being discouraged and feel, don't fear their faces. It's because I want y'all to know that discouragement is waiting outside that door. 
the best idea you have discouragement is waiting right out there as soon as it hits your heart and you call your friend discouragement is right there it's waiting people don't always intend to discourage you but people talk what they see and believe give somebody a vision bigger than their eyes and watch them try to talk you out of it they're only going to ask you one or two questions you really think that's going to happen what makes you think you can do that because they don't have the capacity of faith to believe that the God that brought me out of Egypt and through the Red Sea in 40 years in the wilderness can give me a Canaan promise. Their faith limits their vision. Therefore, paralyzes their efforts. If you can't receive it, why are you going to invest yourself in it? Why are you going to try something you don't think is going to happen? We have to teach our children and we have to teach ourselves that nothing is impossible with God. Y'all don't hear me. Can I ask y'all a question? I'm off the lesson, but I'm on the lesson. Can I ask you a question? If God is fighting your battle and God is going to see you through it, and God is going to take care of you. And God is not going to let any evil or harm come upon you. Why are you cussing and arguing with folk? Why are you trying to tell your side? If vengeance belongs to God and God is going to repay it, why are you acting ugly in the streets? Sometimes the best rebuttal to anything that is said is to zip your mouth and go with God. If God is fighting, what you got to say? Because when you push through this Deuteronomy, if God is going to tell them, don't you lift a finger, because I'm going to give this to you. He'll tell you, don't meddle with them folk, just go in. God's going to tell them, when you get hungry, buy your meat with money. Get your water and pay for it. In other words, stop expecting freebies. Because I've blessed you with the resources you need. And don't you try to get folk to think you're trying to get over on them and talking about favor. In other words, don't go to McDonald's trying to talk folk into a free meal when you know that's a business for profit. Can you see how God is trying to shift their thinking? Excuse me, how God is trying to get them to next level thinking? Can, can, I, can, can you see this? So watch this. I'm almost through. I got six minutes. Watch this. He goes on to say that he took them to a land. They went up to the land. He says, and they took the fruit of the land, 25, brought it down to us, brought the word again and said, it is good. God, in other words, is telling them, I let you go into Canaan and see it. I let the spies go in. You saw that the fruit was good. You brought it. You gave it to us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up. He said, you rebelled against it, the commandments of the Lord. You mumbled against the tents. You mumbled in your tents. But guess what? God heard you because the Lord hated us. He has brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, delivered us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whether we should go up, mm, our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than us. The city is great. The walls up there are high. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. They don't go into the land because they receive a report of ten crazy spies. Only two people come back and saying, let's go. They are so infused by what they see. Man, we got grapes bigger than we ever seen. 
We got pomegranates bigger than we ever seen. Man, we talking about stuff that we got to carry on staff back. They are taller than us, but God and us can take them. Ten men say, we're so small that we look like grasshoppers in their sights. They didn't tell them they were grasshoppers. That's how they measured themselves against them. The danger of measuring yourself against other folk is that you will always come short. If you're going to measure yourself against anybody, measure it against Christ. Yeah, keep looking at me. Because I'm looking at you. Okay. Never measure yourself against anybody except Christ. Genesis, you heard me? Never. You will always come up short. You will always come up short. Let me tell you what happened. Ten folk experienced the same thing as the twelve. These ten experienced everything as the multitude that came out of Egypt. But these ten chosen to go into the camp could not see beyond where they were. In other words, what they told Moses then when they went and looked at the camp of the Canaanites, what they said was, I think we're better off right here. In other words, let's not expect greater. In other words, let us think that this is all that God can do for us. And he goes on to say, watch this. He said this right here. He says in 31, no, 30, 29, he says that, then I said to you, dread not, neither be afraid of them, because that's what God said, don't be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goes before you, shall fight for you according to all that he did for you. Where? Before what? God will fight before your eyes were open. Before you were saved, God was already blessing you. Before you knew God, God already knew you. So before you got your enlightenment, God was already on your side. If God is on your side as a sinner, how much more will he be on your side as a saint? Gary Adams, I wish you were preaching right now. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee, as a man bare his son, in all the way that ye went, until you came to this place. In other words, ever since you've been walking, God's been walking with you. <laughs> Yet, in this thing, ye did not believe the Lord your God. You did not believe that God could do greater. I think I'm going to preach this one Sunday morning. You couldn't believe that God could do greater. Genesis, you don't think God can get you out of mom and daddy's house and give you your own land? You don't think God can set you up on your own foundation? You don't think that God can bring what you see in your head to pass? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. The proof is, if he did it for them, he can do it for me. My proof is looking at my mama now. And if God can take care of them, he could take care of me. Watch this. And the Lord heard your voice. And he was angry. And swear saying, surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation See that good land, which I swear to give to your father. Save Caleb, verse 38, Jacob. Watch this, 37, also the Lord was angry with me because of what y'all were saying in y'all tents and told me I won't go in because y'all been talking too much about the wrong thing. Moses receives a cutoff because the Israelites communication. Don't y'all prevent me. Don't you prevent me from getting over to Canaan. Because the parallel of this story is us getting to heaven and them getting to Canaan. 
Moses said, because of y'all murmuring. When they let y'all go back to y'all tent, y'all heard the other ten talking about, child, ain't no way in the world we're going to go up there. There no children here. I cuss. Boy, we ain't no way in the world we finna go over there. And God said, I ain't going to show you nothing to tease you. I made a promise and showed it to you. It didn't take y'all 40 years to get there. It took me 40 years to weed y'all out. Because doubt ain't going into Canaan. Unbelief ain't going into Canaan. Folk that's wicked in their hearts ain't going to Canaan. Folk that believe is going to Canaan. Listen to this as we close it out. He goes on to say, Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they'll go in. And unto them I give them the land, and they'll possess it. 42, and the Lord said to me, Say to them, get not up yonder. Get, go not up. Because here's what Israel decide. We're going to go fight. We don't change our mind. We're sorry, God. We're just going to go ahead and fight. God said, tell them, don't go up there. They said, oh, we're going to go anyway. God said, don't go up there. They went and fought. And they came back like bees running. They were running like bees was behind them. God, in other words, says, when I ain't with you, you ain't got no victory. And only you go fight when I say fight. Stop cussing your boss out until God tell you to cuss him out. Stop cussing your co-workers out until God tell you to cuss him out. Quit fighting with folk until God tell you to fight with them. Because ain't no victory in what you're doing. Moses makes a petition that I skipped it. Moses asks God again, God, can I please go to the land? God tells Moses, don't you bother me with this conversation no more. You can go up and look north, south, east, and west. You can see what I'm going to do. But don't you have this conversation with me no more about you trying to go to Canaan? You ain't going. That's the end of the story. Thus is the end of chapter one. Be ready for chapter two, three, four, and five next week. I was just warming y'all up. Any comments, questions, thoughts? The only thing God wants from us is obedience to his word. And God don't care who else acting a fool. Just you don't act a fool. Yes, Miss Domino. If they suppose.